uh, this is day three already. Um, so we had two days to be ready for this session. So uh, day one and day two was just warming up and the big session is going on now, about to start. Uh, changing cities with active mobility and we'll be talking about the role of walking and cycling in our cities and hopefully how it can be used to transform our cities and create better uh, living conditions for, for, for everyone. This session is organized um, with the Mobilize Your City partnership. Um, some of you I know in the room are already familiar with the partnership and we have Nicola here, uh, who comes from the MYC Secretariat in uh, Brussels, um, uh, and who will be able to present everything. So for those who already know the partnership, you will know it even better at the end of the session, and all the good things it can bring, and uh, um, all the good work it, it can do uh, with you. And for those who are not yet familiar with the Mobilize Your City partnership, uh, I hope it will be of some um, in inspiration. Uh, just a few words. Um, Mobilize Your City is something that started at the COP in Paris, so eight years uh, uh, from now. And I think we are all uh, amazed with the progress uh, since then. Today, across the world, we have 80 cities that are MYC members. And it's not just being a member, it's committed to this goal of sustainable urban mobility in our cities. Um, and all these things translating uh, into, into action. So uh, if you're a delegate and your city is already a member, you're a guest of honor. Uh, I see also groups where applications to the partnership is, is ongoing and we'll be happy to welcome uh, you very soon. And uh, for those uh, at the end of the session who believe that becoming a member may be a good idea, and of course we encourage that, so you have all uh, the right person to go to in the room. Uh, the session is two hours, so don't expect a break uh, uh, with the, the guys from the other session. So we, go, we do two hours solid, um, a lot of interaction and discussion. We'd like to have it very conversational. Um, so there is a mic, there is a type, uh, tablet and the app you can use for, for the question. Um, so there will be a few presentations. We'd like to give you an overview of what the partnership does uh, and hopefully we'll have an interesting uh, discussion. Uh, and then we do this two hours in the room and then we have one hour for coffee. We can come back here, we can talk about anything related to what the partnership can do, uh, can do for you. Um, yeah, so we'll play just to give you a flavor. Um, in um, November last year, we had a MYC gathering organized in Manila. We had delegation from uh, 10 countries coming. Um, we had guests from the French Development Agency and uh, the Asia De Development Bank and the AFD. We are on a partnership implementing Mobilize Your City in Asia and the Pacific. So as I mentioned, Mobilize Your City is a global partnership and we also have regional program. There is one in Africa, one in Latin America. Uh, Nicolas with, uh, will explain that. Um, and um, ADB and AFD are really working with other partners. Uh, GIZ, of course, uh, has been involved and uh, you will see all the partners, uh, knowledge partner organization, um, ITDP is also a partner. You will see um, all the good friends are working together, uh, joining forces, uh, working with you. Um, so this gathering in, Nove in November last year was also the occasion to launch the phase two of the Mobilize Your City Asia program. Um, so um, it's about bringing uh, assistance, so technical assistance and knowledge, but also um, technical assistance in terms of financial support to um, help you develop this initiative. So there are many, many things uh, the, the partnership would like to, to do with you. Um, I said I will be brief, but I'm uh, very enthusiastic about the program, so I think I already said too much. We will play the video um, of the November event that happened in Manila that will give you a flavor of how things are done. Maybe the most important thing, um, and that's the DNA of the partnership, is really 
to put the people together so that we can have this discussion and talk about how all these nice ideas and ambition that we have can actually translate into action, into a project in the field, whether it's pilot, whether it's large size, um, just to improve the living condition in urban areas. Of course, the thing I should mention, and that is also the second part of the DNA of the partnership, is climate. Uh, very early, I said at the beginning that it all originated at the COP21 uh, in, in Paris. Um, let's play the video, please. To ensure people get around cities is very important. It means how they get to work, how they get to school, how they get to social, meet up with their friends, and how they get to hospitals for emergencies and other medical appointments. Therefore, transport must provide a good system for everybody to get around. At the Asian Development Bank, we estimate that 1.3 billion people have poor access for urban transport, urban public transport, and that is one of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. I would like to ADB or other uh, 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 development partners to uh, study for the possibility for the uh, mass transit of the Tumping City before we need the, the modern transportation for the promoting the people to share the border uh, as we plan to to people to share the more uh, the, the model of 30 percent of the population in Nopen. I believe that global partnerships can amplify our results, the results of our actions, and um, ensuring the uh, impact of our actions, not only at the national level, but also at the uh, international and global level. Uh, also, to work in partnerships gives us, a, in partnership gives us accountability because everybody is responsible for its action, which is essential to, um, to work towards the achievement of our, of our goals. And in the case of Mobilize Your City, towards the goal of sustainable urban mobility. Mobilize Your City partnership is for us an occasion to link and to connect with cities, local government, national government, knowledge partner and development partners in order to address the specific challenges of urban mobility in developing and emerging countries which are specific and also in order to do that in a way which is targeting sustainable development goals. Yeah, in Asian cities, mainly in secondary cities, Paran transit is uh, usually becoming the, more, uh, the main uh, public transport mode in the cities. Okay, so we have a very, very good lineup of speakers for you, but again, it will be uh, a conversation. Um, we'll start with uh, Nicolas Cruz uh, from the MYC Secretariat based in, um, in Europe, in Belgium. And uh, we also have on stage um, with us uh, David, who is Director for Mobility and uh, Transport Department in, in IDOM, so David Moncholi Badillo. Uh, Nicolas, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see Full House here today. I don't know if it's the partnership or the topic you're interested in, but it's still very nice to see you all here. Uh, I would like to thank also ADB for giving us this space to present the partnership and also to elevate this topic of active mobility, um, which uh, we try to push every time we can at the Secretariat. Um, my name is Nicolas Cruz. I'm part of the Mobilize Your City Secretariat based in Brussels. 
I've been working there for a couple of years now, taking care of the methodological development of the partnership and also supporting regional programs um, as the one that we have here in Asia. Um, so I'm gonna go through uh, the history of the partnership a little bit, maybe you already know it, uh, but it's always nice to uh, refresh it a bit. I'm gonna present the, the, introduce the partnership as a whole. Uh, then I'm gonna go through some points. I'm gonna try to convince you that acting of active modes of transport is important for our cities and that it's possible to do it as well. And then uh, I'm gonna try to make the link between the partnership and the work on active modes of transport to tell you a little bit how we can support the work uh, in the cities or your countries if you're interested. Um, so the partnership, as I see it, is a bit this effort to link uh, urban mobility challenges with global issues. And this is because, as Bertrand was saying before, the partnership was born at COP21 in Paris, when the Paris Agreement was signed. Um, and then there was this intention from the EU, the European Union, and the French and the German government to use urban mobility planning as a way to reduce emissions um, looking forward to the challenge that we were setting in the Paris Agreement, uh, but also trying to solve the problems, especially in, in emerging economies and very uh, fast growth cities uh, that we need to meet the needs of people to provide access, but we need to be uh, aware that we have to do it in a, in a careful way to not um, do it in an unsustainable manner. Um, so basically, uh, we have some donors in the partnership, the European Union uh, and the French government represented mainly through AFD, uh, the FFAM and the Ministry for Ecological Transition. And then from the German side, we have the Ministry of Economic and Development Cooperation and the Ministry of Environment. And then what we try to do is to uh, coordinate with these donors to canalize uh, funding. Uh, so our implementing partners, that are the partners that you can see in the second line of the slide, mainly the AFD, the GAZ, and now also the ADB, um, to implement projects uh, mainly related to sustainable urban mobility planning uh, all over the world. So we have projects in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern Europe. And basically what we promote is sustainable urban mobility plans, what we call the SUMPs or SUMPs that you might know and the national version of it, the National Urban Mobility Policies and Investment Programs, or NUMPS. Um, we have some other partners, knowledge and network partners, with whom we work very closely um, to identify knowledge gaps, for example, to also produce knowledge for our members, um, and to try to elevate topics that we think are important, like active modes of transport, paratransit, and urban mobility governance. Some of the organizations that are here today um, sharing this uh, event uh, are members of Mobilize Your City, ITDP, for example, UN Habitat, uh, and so on. And then we also collaborate with some regional programs uh, from our partner institutions, uh, TUMI, Euroclima in Latin America. Uh, we have the Mobilize Your City program in Asia. Uh, and we also work with the UN in the Marrakesh Partnership. Um, so besides the institutional partners that we have, we also have uh, members uh, that are countries or cities all over the world. Uh, so as Bertrand was saying, we have almost 80 uh, cities, 72, and then also 16 countries that have joined the partnership since 2015. And then around half of them are receiving technical assistance from uh, one of our, one or uh, some of our partners. Um, and then when I say technical assistance, uh, we provide these four service areas that you can see there. So the first one is mobility planning, and this is just the effort of uh, supporting cities and countries in going through the process of developing an, a planning instrument for urban mobility, either at the local or at the national level. Um, then we also have some capacity building activities. We try to produce uh, methodologies and guidance on different topics. In, on the table, you can see the, uh, you can take one if you want, a printed version of the some guidelines that we did at Mobilize Your City, in which we tried to adapt this concept of sustainable urban mobility plans 
uh, that was very popular in Europe and tried to uh, put it in context in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And that's where, for example, we realized that uh, taking care of paratransit was very particular and was not uh, very well covered uh, in a lot of uh, uh, literature that was available. And we produced this knowledge to make available the paratransit toolkit, for example. Um, and then we also uh, provide training sessions for cities and countries, either in person or online. Uh, we have a lot of webinars that we organize at Mobilize Your City. Very soon we will have one with Clement uh, explaining the Mobilize Your City um, Asia program. Um, and then we also do advocacy. Uh, in the advocacy, we do it both at the local and the international level. So what I'm doing here to try to convince you that active modes of transport are important, but also we try to do it at the local level to mobilize decision makers uh, to allocate resources, uh, efforts, and funding for uh, topics that we think are important for sustainable mobility. And then the last service area is implementation support, and this is because the first generation of uh, sustainable urban mobility plans that Mobilize Your City supported already are already adopted and the cities, some cities need some additional support to start implementing the measures that are proposed in these plans. Um, and then we're trying to figure out how to uh, keep uh, supporting the cities to accomplish their objectives. So this is some results uh, from the partnership. So as you can see, we have mobilized around 54.7 million euros from our donors uh, to prepare around 31 SOMPs and um, nine NOMPs, so at the national level, from which already 19 SOMPs are already completed or adopted and six NOMPs uh, have been completed. And then you can see that we have identified 27 billion uh, euros in investment needs, and this is the measures that we have in the action plans. It's a lot of money. Uh, for cities and countries that want to transform their urban mobility. But the good news is that from all these investment needs, uh, we have already uh, leveraged 1.7 billion euros, and this is not uh, minor. And this is coming from different sources uh, of uh, finance. So, of course, domestic sources and international loans, but also international grants, and this is where we play the role uh, at Mobilize Your City. And then for the secured finance, so projects that have already uh, secured finance to be implemented, it's 1.5 billion around. And as you can see, it's mainly for public transport infrastructure development, um, public transport vehicles, so buses mainly, and then walking and cycling, you can see it's over there and it's a very minor part, 1.7%. And this is, this is not only because um, it's, very, it's a very small part of the uh, plans, but it's also because normally the projects related to walking and cycling are way cheaper than any other projects. Um, and then on that side, you can see some estimations that we have of the impact that we can produce uh, with these uh, measures that are proposed and with the projects that are already financed. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, this is just to show that this is kind of the work that we do at the Secretariat and is to aggregate all the impact uh, that the partners uh, are expecting from different projects uh, worldwide. Um, this is for the partnership, and then considering what I just said about walking and cycling now, I'm going to try to convince you why uh, we should try to enlarge this number, 1.7% 1, 1 of investment in walking and cycling uh, in your cities. Um, so I'm going to talk about eight key benefits of walking and cycling um, in general. And this is just to, sorry, this is just to challenge this myth that in our cities it's not possible to walk and cycle. Uh, and before going into these eight key um, benefits of walking and cycling, um, this is just to show that in our cities, and this is a table from Mobilize Your City Cities, uh, people are already work, walking or cycling, so this is already like a mode of transport that very, it's very well used uh, by a lot of people for different reasons. Uh, maybe it's because it's the most affordable way to go around. Uh, maybe it's because they find it nice. Uh, I don't know if it's the case in many cities. But especially, for example, in Asia, in Abbottabad, more than 60% are already walking. 
um, and this is and this should be already enough reason to act on this to uh, improve conditions for people to walk better to cycle better um, and to consider them in the in the policy actions that we have um, so the first the first benefit uh, is that walking is the foundation of the city and this means that when you see a travel or like a normal trip even if you go by car or you take public transport most probably we will have to walk um, so you start uh, walking you maybe take the bus and then you end your trip walking uh, all trips start and finish uh, by walking and then um, it's a really the foundation of all sustainable mobility uh, walking because it's the most efficient way uh, to go around. <clears throat> and then as we were seeing also here in Manila, many of the trips that people do in a city are short trips, so less than three or four kilometers. And this means that there is a huge opportunity uh, to replace any mode of transport for uh, walking and cycling. But of course it depends on the conditions that the city have to, 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 to provide this infrastructure for people. <laughs> Uh, the third benefit is that walking and cycling are space and cost efficient and these are more like the economic dimension of why to promote walking and cycling. Um, and this is interesting because from the individual uh, point of view, if you want to walk, you don't have to pay any fee, it's for free. Um, it's virtually free, then when you have a bike it's, it gets more complicated, but normally you don't have to pay every time you take your bike out. Um, and then from the city point of view, uh, to maintain and to provide infrastructure for these modes is way cheaper compared to any other uh, mode of transport. And then uh, the other part is that these um, modes of transport do not have the negative externalities that other motorized transport can have. Uh, so it's also cheaper for the city in the long run uh, to support this uh, way of people moving. Uh, so it includes, of course, that it doesn't contribute to air, 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 air pollution and noise pollution. Um, so uh, this is more like that was the economic side of view. And then here is more like the social side. Walking and cycling are inclusive and equitable. Um, so it, anyone can like walk in the city from kids to the elderly. And then um, you can have social encounters in the street when the streets are not only for transit, but also for encounter and to, and to stay there. And then also when you're walking on cycling, you also promote healthy lifestyles, uh, which contribute also to well-being um, for people. <clears throat> um, in the economic point of view, walking and cycling generates local economic development. And this has to do also with the capillarity that these modes of transport have. So maybe when you're walking, you have the opportunity to move around your neighborhood, stop by a shop, try to discover it a little bit. When you're driving or when you're going faster in public transport, it's very difficult to do so. Um, so uh, there are cases, and this is one from South Korea, uh, in which uh, pedestrianization of a street uh, increased uh, the numbers of sales. Uh, in the neighborhood, and this is counterintuitive because normally people don't want to open uh, their streets just for pedestrians, claiming that it will impact negatively their businesses. Um, and then one that is very important uh, is that walking and cycling are resilient forms of transport, and this is not only from the climate dimension, uh, but also, for example, in a disaster, uh, you can still walk even if like the infrastructure is not in place and we also saw it during the COVID pandemic um, walking and cycling had a boost because there were alternatives uh, low hang fruits let's say uh, people could move around without facing the the problems that public transport had at the time so this is the eight reasons that I was giving you, and now uh, I'm going to go very quickly through how Mobilize Your City support um, walking and cycling. So I come back to the service areas that I was presenting just before. Uh, and then for mobility planning, um, we have uh, really encouraged cities to collect data on walking and cycling because we saw that in traditional transport planning is something that is not very well covered. 
And this is how we know now, for example, that in, in Dakar, more than 70% of people walk around the city. Imagine that you don't include walking as a mode of transport where you're doing a household survey. Uh, you're missing more of the of half of the trips, and then when you include this type of information, like the mo the mobility planning cycle really changes because you start including measures that you would normally w don't include. Um, and then also in the partnership, we have these experiences in which we, uh, for example, in Cuba in Havana, uh, the sum was done with the expectation of implementing a pilot project uh, to pedestrianized uh, street, uh, so it changes all the way the, the sump uh, goes because they have in mind already that there is an outcome on active mobility that, that, that they want to get. And then in Antananarivo, in Madagascar, there is another case in which uh, the sump is going to be made, only it's a small part of a huge project of 10 million euros all around uh, active mobility. Uh, so for sure, it's gonna like the sump is gonna be shaped around active modes, and this is also um, something that changed the mindset of decision makers and people um, because it's another way of doing planning. On the capacity building side with ITDP, we uh, developed these training materials uh, on active modes. So this is to convince decision makers as I'm doing today, to uh, act on active mobility. Uh, and if you want to replicate these training sessions that I'm going to present on the next slide, just contact me, contact the Secretariat, and then we will support in this effort. Um, and then we will, we're trying to make these toolkits with uh, partners' materials uh, to provide guidelines and methodologies to act on active mobility. On the advocacy side, we're gathering with SLOCAD, actually, uh, we're working on a paper to uh, gather economic reasons uh, to allocate budgets for active modes of transport and to present this on international events, but also uh, to present, for example, to mayors or governors or uh, ministries of transport. Uh, also, so we do that the national government support the investment on active modes of transport because it's not the case now. Uh, and then in implementation support, we've been uh, supporting um, municipalities in implementing active modes of transport uh, projects because the institutional arrangement that you need to actually implement these projects are quite different to just uh, provide a road or construct uh, a facility because it involves uh, things of public space, maybe recreation, and you need to involve different stakeholders of the same government. Um, to, to make it successful. I'm not going to go uh, beyond that. On the table you will find the, um, some guidelines of Mobilize Your City. It has uh, also the Global Monitor, there is the report. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, the Global Monitor, there is the report of our activities. Uh, last year you will, you will also find the SOM guidelines, uh, which is the 13 steps to produce a sustainable urban mobility plan, which are a huge component of active mobility. And then the other publications of uh, integrating land use and urban mobility planning, also because it can happen at the street level and how to redistribute the space to give a little bit of um, room for active modes, and then on the other side you will find the trainings that we have available and then we made together with ITDP. Um, if you want to replicate these training sessions, if you're interested in the topic, reach out to me. Uh, thank you very much for being there, uh, and I'm very happy to see you all here today. Thank you, Nicolas, for this wonderful uh, introduction. Now, David, um, you're going to talk to us about the Walk and Cycle City Challenge. Hello, everyone. I am David Moncholi. I am a transport planner, and during my years of practice, I've been, I had the chance to plan uh, not only in Europe, I come from Valencia in Spain, but also in Latin America, Africa, Asian cities. Uh, and, and so I can I can say that I have kind of an of, you know universal idea on how to tackle mobility and uh, mobility and, and walkability. The title of the presentation is um, a, the Walk and Cycle City Challenge, uh, defying the impossibilities of urban design for pedestrians and bicycles in our cities. 
my colleague before just highlighted the, you know, some of the best or the most important elements on the benefits of walking and cycling. This is something that we all agree, we all understand, but when it comes, we as planners uh, or, or cities or stakeholders, when it comes to implementing or starting the project, then quite a lot of problems start to arise, quite a lot of impossibilities start to arise when it comes to walking and cycling. The walk and cycling uh, provocation because in my opinion, this is a kind of a provocation. Uh, I don't know if this sounds familiar to you. So we have a nice car, friendly car, and you know the guy says, okay, I would like to go from Hong Kong, China to Macau. I would like to. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's some kilometers away, there's a you know, there's sea in between, and we as humans with our technology, we start thinking, and then we end up building the longest sea bridge in the world, uh, which is uh, 400 tons of steel, uh, which is enough to construct 60 Eiffel Towers. Uh, it can you know, resist earthquakes of magnitude eight, super typhoons, the impact of vessels, which I saw some months ago, month, barely one month ago, when you know bridge which collapsed after a, a vessel. Um, so we 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 spend kind of a 15 billion dollars on the infrastructure to carry, and please remember this number, to carry about 6,500 vehicles per day. So this is what we as humans, as uh, with our technology nowadays, this is what we can achieve. Uh, this is, for example, a Commonwealth Avenue in Manila. I don't know if we can count the number of lanes that we have here, but quite a lot. Uh, the other picture is Sheikh Shair Road in Dubai. I don't know if you mean there, but at some points, uh, Sheikh Shair Road has more than 13 lanes per direction, so it's a huge amount of traffic lanes. And suddenly, me, uh, I normally cycle, or I, I really like to walk, but some, some girl, nice girl, asks, say, hey, can I get some space for my bike? Uh, just remember, here in Metro Manila, which is only 2% of modal share of cycling, but that 2% of modal share of cycling in Manila, Metro Manila makes 745,500 trips, compared to the 6,000 that we said before. So can I have some space for my preferred mode of transportation? Uh, uh, this is, you know, how we treat uh, pedestrians and how we treat uh, bicycles uh, here in Metro Manila. So I don't know if you can hardly see any sidewalk or any place where pedestrians... This is really near, and this is close to the uh, Ortiga station coming to, to the bank here. So it is merely not even a meter width. Uh, and what about the pedestrians? Can we fit in here, pedestrians? In Metro Manila, we have 30% of moda share of, of walking. That's more than 10 million, nearly 11 million trips per day, which deserve their urban space. Uh, and then, this happens not only in Metro Manila, of course, this is in, in Port Louis, Mauritius. We did some planning last summer. This is how you wait for the traffic light. This is a man in Jordan, so you're crossing the street, and you know the path starts to narrow, 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 until you can make some try to balance, uh, you know, the sidewalk disappears, then you don't know where to go. Uh, wh where is our share of the space, of the road space, where? I mean, we are a good part of the, of the transportation mode share. We are a good part of people moving around. Where is our space? And when we ask this question to our nice car, who was able to travel from, from uh, Hong Kong, China to, to Macau, uh, this nice car turns into a super angry SUMB, and when you ask any transport traffic planner in any city, they will tell you, it is completely impossible. There is not enough room for bikes. Technically not feasible, I like that, because whenever it says technically not feasible, how can you counter uh, fake that? How can you respond to that? You will cause enormous congestion, and you will create safety issues for pedestrians. Well, the first thing I have to tell you is that they are all wrong. It is possible. And I'm not going to, to use uh, some famous phrases, but yes, it is possible. Uh, I just highlight some examples. 
during my life, I, 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 I have been honored to plan the city where I live as a consultant. Uh, so we made a sustainable urban mobility plan some years ago, and the city hall, they really believed in the proposals and they implemented them uh, to the point, this is something I always say as a joke, but it's a real. Uh, when, when they start implementing a new part of the project, my mother would call me and she would ask me, is this your fault, David? And I have to say, yes, mama, it is my fault. This is how the town hall, the very center of the city, looked like a few years ago, three or four years ago. And this is how it looks like today. And it was done nearly in one week. So it just took the cars out. You didn't need really a lot of me because you just changed a little bit of the pavement. So it's not really a hard intervention at all. It's very cheap. And we did that. This is how the town uh, market square, which is a uh, UNESCO heritage site, the market square and the silk, silk uh, stock exchange, which is from the Middle Age uh, World Heritage uh, site. Uh, this is how it looked like, and this is how it looks like today. No one hardly remembers that there was a lot of cars there. And now it's become one of the you know, unique places in the city to walk, sit, spend time, enjoy the weather, enjoy the city, enjoy the sights. This is where the cathedral is. So this is on the uh, this is the uh, Reina Square, uh, how it looked uh, before. This is how it looks today, and it was done very easily. I mean, this intervention was a little bit harder, but again, you can do it. Uh, you can do it. But not only in, in Valencia, in Spain, you know, we always think that in Europe we have the resources and the chances and the mentality. No, no, it can happen everywhere. This is Kigali in Rwanda, which uh, I was doing some training at the university two years ago, and they have already implemented sidewalks, proper sidewalks, proper cycling, proper pedestrian zones in the very center of the city. They have a bike sharing scheme. And again, Dubai, uh, which I showed you before, the Sheikhshire Road, full of cars. Uh, we were, uh, we were um, uh, contracted by the Roads and Transport Authority to do the non-motorized transport master plan. So we prepare a plan for them, how to enhance walking and cycling in Dubai. It's very warm in summer. It's nice in winter, but really warm in summer. How do you encourage? Uh, so we prepared some plans, we prepared some ideas, and the good thing is that they believed us and they implemented it they started building some areas, and nowadays we propose them, for example, you must install biking, parking, so facilities to park your bikes near the metro. They did, and this is how it looks like today. So there are a lot of people commuting to Metro Dubai by bicycle, and they couldn't believe it, and they did it. Uh, so yes, first lesson, yes, you can. I mean, no matter what, you can. Second thing, uh, or second lesson, each transport mode requires its appropriate set of infrastructure and elements, and so, do, and so does walking and cycling. Most of us, as our uh, you know, university background, we study traffic, and we study, and, and we are traffic engineers at the beginning, and then we, we, we go into the dark side of the, of the technical, and we turn into advocates of walking and cycling. But when you are doing traffic planning, they will tell you level of service, number of lanes, the, you know, the, uh, the ramps and the, the, the radios of all the bends, everything is so technical. And when you're planning for cars, you will never forget for parking spaces. A, a lot of cities, nearly all of the cities in the world, they have parking policies. How many number of parking spaces for cars do I have to reserve on the urban spaces? This way of thinking must be transferred to walking and cycling the same way. If someone tells you, uh, so walking and cycling is not only bike and lane, so as I'm telling you, we have to treat walking and cycling the same way as public uh, vehicles. For pedestrians, if we are doing planning in Seville uh, um, or in Dubai, uh, we need to have uh, uh, parking facilities. When you are uh, driving your, your, your cycling, your bicycle, and you reach to the, to the station, you need to leave your bicycle somewhere. Do not forget that. Um, when we are thinking on pedestrians, uh, and we, they, they always tell me, when, when we started in Dubai, it's very warm here. I told them, it's so warm in South Spain. You cannot believe it. It's 45 degrees in the summer. And people walk. Are we different? No. The thing is that we provide for the proper infrastructure. If it's sunny, we need shading. And shading becomes a part of the infrastructure of walking. 
and cycling. So when you are planning your sidewalks, remember to do some greening or some shading. And remember, we did a sustainable urban mobility plan in Brazil, in Sobral, and we were doing the SUMP, and at the same time, there was a greening plan, the arborization plan for the city. They built, they, they planted a lot of trees. This is done in Manila, when it's, you know, here in Southeast Asia, it's, it's wet, rainy, most of the time, it's very humid. In Mauritius, we have that by heart in Spain, in Seville, South of Spain, in Madrid. If you go in summer in Madrid, the major commercial streets are covered. Uh, this is uh, uh, a downtown in Doha, Qatar, which has been conceived also with shading. Uh, so again, when we think of cars, we never forget any of the elements that really are required for that transportation mode, but we always forget the elements that are required for walking and cycling. And this must to be taken into account. It's no big deal, just take them into account. And the last lesson, uh, I call it the, instead of the you know, upside down design, I would say the outside in design of the street. Um, the two most sustainable means of transportation nowadays are uh, bicycle and cycling, and this has been our natural means of transportation since the, since the beginning of, of humanity. We use our own human energy. Uh, the use of a space, the level of emissions, noise, the use of energy, all these parameters are completely unbeaten if we compare motorized means of transportation against walking and cycling. I mean, from any KPI you would to compare, walking and cycling is always best. Why the upside down design? Uh, we have we have to reverse the the, the importance on how we plan. Uh, we have to normally we give a lot of space to vehicles, share mobility, public transport, and the leftovers, the reminders of this of the, of the streetscape. We leave it for walking, and that's why we have less than one meter coming from Ortiga Station to here, which is unbelievable for me, and thousands of cars passing by. Uh, we have to make this the other way around and give more urban spaces for the vast majority. So if we were to use a democratic share of the space, the more users are walking, uh, so the more space they should have or they should deserve. But I also like to, to make or what we call the outside in design. So try to design your street uh, in, in another way. Uh, uh, we need to design cities again for people. Now we are starting to talk about uh, autonomous vehicles and you know these flying objects that we solve finally solve the mobility problem in our cities. Uh, and I always use this hint to see if that way of planning is human-centered or not. If I see people walking or cycling in any nice render that they send to me, if I see walking and cycling, not the major uh, picture that you have, then it is plan properly. If you see, like the image on the, on, the, on the right, some people inside their autonomous vehicles and no one, really literally no one using the, the streets, this is the way of planning that we don't want, that we don't, I mean, I don't like, we don't want, because we are not addressing the challenge or the needs of, of, the, of, the, of the people. We have to rethink the space from the from the uh, so it's from the inside to the outside. More move more people in less space. That means that we have to prioritize public transportation as the backbone of the mobility, especially in cities like Manila, in which although a big majority of the trips are shorter trips, but still there are trips which cannot be made by walking and cycling. This is clear. I mean, Valencia is only one million inhabitants. Manila is 20 million. No way. Uh, then you have to give the right space to, to traffic and then give a huge amount of space to those who move or uh, uh, really transfer from one point to another in a more sustainable way. Uh, as a planners, uh, the, this way of designing when we are, we are hired by, by any administration, it's a unique chance that we have as planners to propose a city model in which mobility takes place in a safe environment and an efficient, intelligent way. It's our opportunity to recover urban space for the people and assure their mobility needs are met while social and economical interactions are favored. It is deciding, or me as a consultant, helping others decide, helping the stakeholders make the right decision 
to decide what type of city we want. So do we want one which is continuous collapsed, noisy, polluted? Electrical vehicles are not the solution for pollution in the cities. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the tires, they really make a lot of emissions, the small particles, and electrical vehicle, they still have tires, so the problem is not solved. We have to choose between this kind of city you cannot cross Sexier Road, you cannot, I mean, you cannot simply, or we have to choose between this, this model city. I, I told you, th this, is the, this is Burj Khalifa station, this is where uh, Dubai Mall is, this is a metro station. If you stay in, in Tassid Duni Hotel on the other side, it's merely 300 meters, you cannot take the metro. You cannot walk to the metro, you have to take a taxi from the from hotel to reach the metro station. Uh, uh, but this is, uh, this is also Dubai. So the both realities can, can happen. So it can happen as long as you plan in the right way, as long as you share in the right proportion the urban space. Thank you very much. I hope that your, I blew your mind. Salamat po, and I am at your disposal. Thank you, David. And um, I think we all like your um, enthusiasm and uh, energy. I've seen a lot of nodding, uh, a lot of picture taking also So uh, during your, your speech, so that has been great. Um, Nicholas, I have a question I would like to ask you. Um, it's a very simple one. You touch uh, upon it a little bit, but what would be your answer to somebody asking you how to mobilize your city? Uh, can best support city members to adopt an active mobility-driven approach? Um, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to say something that is very obvious, but at Mobilize Your City, uh, at the Mobilize Your City partnership, we support uh, developing SUMPs, sustainable urban mobility plans. Um, and when a city uh, really follows our methodology, they're going to find that uh, embedded in our methodology, there is this vision of supporting act active modes of transport. Um, also because at the, part at the partnership, we say that uh, an SUMP can be either a product or a process. And uh, so in these two ways, as a product, uh, it really helps the city to have this a uh, huge list of measures uh, mostly related to active mobilities. Uh, they, the city then has a roadmap in which uh, they can choose from infrastructure development to redistribution of space, policy making, advocacy, promotion, uh, facilities development. There is a lot of things that you can include in your SOMP. Uh, and the nice thing of this is that you can have um, short, mid, and long-term vision of where the city is going in terms of active modes of transport. So uh, even if the government changes and even if there is new people uh, working on this, uh, there is already a guidance on uh, where you can go also because normally this is concerted among uh, a lot of stakeholders. So this is not one person's vision of the city, but also uh, a city's vision of where they want to go. Uh, so this is as a product. And then as a process also, when you're developing a SOMP, then you realize that you need to coordinate with different institutions, stakeholders. It's not only the transport department that is uh, taking care of the SOMP, that is the one who's finally implementing it. And then especially for active modes of transport, there is this particularity uh, that having, for example, pilots on, on active modes of transport, that is what we also do at Mobilize Your City. Uh, you really push for this uh, institutional rearrangement in which you realize how different institutions need to work together and can work together in order to have successful projects uh, of walking and cycling. Sometimes they're very simple as uh, preparing and organizing our car-free day or an open street day. Uh, you can see a completely different city uh, that day uh, and then you can go to uh, promoting cycling lanes or doing policy for walking and cycling and then for each of these projects you will see a different set of actors and stakeholders that will be involved and I think this is the value of uh, piloting this kind of projects because it really 
uh, helps to to set the stage uh, for future uh, more complex projects for the city. Thank you. And so you're telling us that uh, SAMP is a very powerful tool. Uh, the preparation and development is as important as the final product. It usually takes between a year or two. Uh, you describe all the, the consultation, making sure that all stakeholders and groups are involved uh, in the process. Uh, so that first uh, part. And then the beauty of a SUMP is that it will um, inform um, decision making. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not just, I want to do this project because it's nice, I've seen it somewhere else. So it becomes really tailored to the context of your city. Uh, you have this investment plan that are developed and you have um, a strategy, where to start, uh, where to demonstrate good progress that you can build on and then go to the other step. Mm -hmm. So some, I think the power of some is sometimes not understood and um, we and decision maker will of course wait for the product to be developed, but uh, the power starts from day one of the preparation and the process, I would say from we observe, is as important as a, as a, as a final uh, product. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nicholas. Now, David, um, I think you convinced us all already, but maybe my question to you is that you are in front of somebody that is extremely reluctant uh, to develop um, active modes in a city. So what would be your main argument to try to convince that person? <laughs> That's a tricky question. <laughs> no, the, the thing is that uh, uh, each, each, when, when you face a, a city, a new city, the, the pattern repeats itself all the time. They will tell you this city is particular. This is very special. It's not like other city. And the first thing we always think is that, okay, you are going to behave exactly the same way as the other cities did. So the pattern will reproduce. So first of all, uh, you can showcase other examples that really worked. This is, this is important. In my opinion, the, the, also one of the elements is that you, first of all, you have to remain technical. I mean, this is, this is not an opinion. This is pure technical. So, uh, and, and we have to rely on calculations. And we as planners, we know how to make proper calculations. This together with the, with the right set of objectives. And for example, when, when, when we face walking and cycling many times, they will tell us, if you reduce the road space, you are going to cause congestion. This is the main uh, theme. So the problem is congestion, yes. So we want to reduce congestion, yes. I will show you how you reduce congestion. Congestion is uh, a bad balance between demand and capacity and, and supply. Most of the times in many cities, our supply is constrained. We cannot build as many lanes. Probably if you are in the States, in America, you have a lot of space, you can do it. But in many cities, the space is limited. So if you don't have space and you want to have a balance between demand and space, you have to reduce demand. So in order to solve congestion, you just don't build more lanes, you just reduce the number of users. And how do you do that? We have to offer options for those users to move around in various different ways. Walking, cycling, public transportation. If you make the right calculation, the mode shift is going to counterbalance the number of lanes that you are going to reduce. So congestion is never going to happen. And this is, you can support that technically. At some point, they will have to make, a, I call it an act of faith. They will have to believe in you. Uh, this is the critical moment. But so far in my experience, the pattern has repeated itself. Uh, we did some planning in, in another city. We made a mayor street pedestrian. There was, especially the shop owners, they were really against it. We did it. I mean, the mayor believed in that. He did it. Uh, one year after, the surrounding shop owners of the surrounding streets were claiming the streets to be pedestrianized because they saw the benefits of that. They saw the increase in sales, the increase in people, the nice environment, and they, one year before they were all against it, one year after they were saying, I want my share of that, okay? And this has been repeating 
in many, many times. So at the end, I would say we have to remain technical and make the right calculations, set up the right targets. So if you want to reduce congestion, that's okay. We will make it. We will make it. We will, we will reduce congestion. If you want to reduce emissions, if you want to enhance quality of life, these targets, these can be met, and we will make the right decisions to, to make it happen. And at some point, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> we believe you, David. And uh, thank you. And uh, space really is the most valuable asset that a city has. So using it wisely is maybe uh, the, the best advice we can give to, to decision maker. And as you said, um, there is truth in a real life example, uh, but there are also truths in um, technical approach and um, being able to, to develop the best solution uh, for, for each uh, of, of the city. Uh, thank you, David. Let me now call two more friends um, to join us uh, on the stage. Uh, I would like to invite Deliani Siregar from ITDP um, Indonesia. <laughs> and my dear co ADB colleague, Ramola Singru. So Ramola is a principal urban development specialist in the urban sector group in, in ADB. And Deliani is a senior urban planning, gender, social inclusion associate at ITDP Indonesia. Um, so, same thing. Um, uh, we'll start with, with you, Deliani. So, you're going to talk to us about the importance of active mobility and um, the for the first and last mile connectivity. Please, Deliani. So yeah, thank you everyone, so good morning. Um, thanks for having us today and also be participated with this session. I see some of familiar faces coming from the first day, so thank you for coming back again to the session. So, well, yeah, I would like to do storytelling a little bit, talking about the importance of having the active mobility as the first and last miles connectivity and something that we've done so far with Jakarta officials. And the thing is, um, we are really want to give you some senses about the issues back then when we are working with the government and also about the opportunities. Later on, we also will tell you about a little bit story about the timeline of changes and how about we do the planning process and also the lessons learned from doing these things. And here it goes, when back to 2004, actually ITDP also help the Jakarta government to work for the BRT, the Trans Jakarta, the first BRT in Indonesia. We worked, but back then, the evaluations of our site said that the planning of the public transportation hasn't considered about the importance of having a very good um, active mobility networks to assist this kind of like implementation. So based on our study in 2016, it said that for the first corridor and sixth corridor of the Trans Jakarta PRT, which is like very huge and main and popular corridor for the Trans Jakarta PRT, the thing is they are still lack of the passengers. And some complaints coming from the citizens say that because there is no adequate uh, site uh, the walking facilities as well as it because of its very narrow sidewalk or even the network is not there or even like the condition is pretty much bad and the BRT is becoming very inaccessible for people who live in within 500 meters within the radius of the surfaces. So with this kind of like uh, things happened, we really want to go and help the Trans Jakarta, the BRT to improve the services and how to make these kind of like networks can be accessed for more people who live in within the services. Though now the Trans Jakarta already achieved 1 million passengers due to the massive improvement along the corridors and how we do this because we really want to improve the connectivity from the residential area within the network or around the networks and to connect 
to the stations. It's also happened, the similar situations happened to the MRT Jakarta where we did the, uh, the study and also the evaluation for the accessibility towards their 13 stations. So these kind of like very bad conditions really influence the passengers number of the services. And it was very difficult because it's not also talking about how good the sidewalk, how good the pavement is, but it's also where the officials think to build more bridges instead of the at-grid crossings, for example. And now where ICTP assists the cities, so ICTP actually the NGO, we do also consultancy works with the cities in Indonesia and our scope actually for Southeast Asia. Uh, back then we worked with the Pakistan like Karachi and also Peshawar, also Baku in Azerbaijan. We did kind of like these similar projects, but for Jakarta specifically, we do this kind of like collaboration with many, many stakeholders. For example, we work with the city government. We mainly talk with the Jakarta Public Works Agency and also the transport agency to give them some senses. We do some of collaboration on how we should do technically make it possible to work on the active mobility infrastructures. We also work, uh, work with together with the public transport operators, in this case with TransJakarta and also MRT Jakarta, to understand about the networks, how they can do contribution more to bringing more people by improving the walking and also cycling in, uh, facilities. We work with the communities, we work with the NGOs, we work with the academia as well, we work with the vulnerable groups, because nowadays we are really highlighting the importance of having universal design and inclusive access to be accessed for all people. And we do with the citizens for, uh, for sure, and also we do some collaborations with the media, including we collaborate with number of people and young people influencers to work for the social media as well. So the thing is, we do this kind of like holistic approach, not only talking about we do assistance in giving technical assistance, but we also help Jakarta to build inclusive pedestrian facilities. It resulted in roadmap. We do some of like study and it resulted for 2000 and seven to 2022 roadmap. And now, uh, earlier this year, we also already submitted the roadmap recommendation for 2023 to 2027. And the thing is, in 2018, for example, we conducted series of workshops, training. We do also walking tours, a lot of walking tours. We invited Jakarta's officials to do the walking tours, to do the audits, just because we want to collect more data and increase the public awareness. So starting the project, we are usually not only collect data by ourselves, but we also start with the communication and also public outreach start in the beginning, just like to let people complain a lot and understand about the needs and how we can fit the needs. So the technical assistance were given. Um, we also have kind of like um, pilot projects, more kind of like urban tactics, uh, tactical um, projects to be tested. And then later on in 2019, we finally do a pedestrianization, like a very big pedestrianization in Jakarta that in encourage more than 5,000 people per hour in around the MRT station. And it assisted the stations to get more kind of like adequate accessibility to the stations. And finally in 2019 as well, so around 2018 and 2019, we very, uh, have a very good chances because of Jakarta finally can revamp the facilities for the pedestrians and also cycling in the Sudirman Street, which is our biggest and famous street. Uh, back then and finally we initiate Jakarta Ramah Bersepeda. We do the co-planning and design process, protected bike lane as the result. Before that, we do the pop-up bike lane to be tested and also we gather number of comments coming from the Jakartans, especially for the other road users coming from maybe motorbikes and also the cars users. We also also do school access improvement. We work together with the schools to understand and also develop how we create safe uh, school network, something like that. And we also do another kind of like approach working with the kampung, like residential area, where we understand that it's still possible to be connected directly to the 
public transport services. And finally, in 2021 and 2022, we work for much bigger project for reclaiming the old town to be pedestrianized back to it and also giving more spaces for active mobility to reclaim the space. And this is kind of like the thing we understand that in the beginning, we work for corridor based network. So the importance of having this kind of like massive improvement is really concentrate with the networks because we are not really do this kind of like walking only on the arterial road or collector road, but to see it as an area-based and network approach, we can understand that we really can walk everywhere within our neighborhood, for example. So within our work to do the roadmap, we also try to understand about what kind of like policies already available and our opportunities to revise it or maybe we should like create new policies and also regulations to fulfill the needs and also we need to see any kind of like points related with the public transportation services and we also see the area connectivity it means there are a number of the diverse public services within the area to be seen and then after that, we do some of consultation with the officials and then with the public consultations. We do this kind of like table of criteria. We make criteria, indicators, we set the weight. We can see how then we want to score it, which element will be play important role and so on and so on. And with these kind of like criteria, we finally can create the roadmap. And here we go as the result for the Jakarta roadmap and MT roadmap in 2023 to 2027. And as I mentioned, why we need to assist Jakarta or other cities in Indonesia, for example, what ITDB did is because we understand that every, every single discussion that we had with our officials, they said we have a very limited budget every year to work on the pedestrians and cycling infrastructure. So how we should manage our funding to fit the needs. So based on this kind of like works, after we understanding which area should be prioritized, for example, we can really give a recommendation to the officials about which one, where, and how, and also including the typology. So within our typologies in the roadmap, so if you want to see further, you can like access our website for, uh, for sure. Because there, you can see we also recommend the typologies. It consists about, so for example, if you have 20 meters width of the road, then how it should be designed, for example. Will it be complete straight? Will it be... A share street, for example, or will it be slow street? Something like that. So we help the cities to identify per years how many uh, money is needed and where to implement the improvement. And as the lessons learned, based on our assistance to the cities, especially for the Jakarta, this kind of like a very long and continuous process and we need to collaborate. So ICDP, as you know, uh, we do not work by ourselves and the government by the government itself, but we also do collaborate with other entities and also um, the public because we need public support. So that's why if you go to our Instagram, for example, we also do a number of campaigns and also social media publication to, to do this kind of like engagement with the public. And we do also uh, understand that we need to elevate the needs of Jakarta to implement those kind of like recommendation by adopting these recommendations into regulation and policy. So that's why ITTP also assist the cities to create local and national. Uh, finally, we last year, we finally worked together with the Ministry of Public Works and Housing, where finally we also helped them to launch the inclusive guidance for making infrastructures, pedestrian infrastructure for a national level and we do believe that within the, uh, this kind of like assistant it this kind of like work can be scaled up because in some practices actually we do urbanism tactical urbanism for example in number of cases to show uh show off about what kind of like things that can be happened if we do this and that and if it doesn't fit with 
number of complaints coming from the road users. We can also invite them to give comments and to see how can we achieve the win-win situation. And then these kind of like three months, six months evaluations, we post it publicly and also we do kind of like recommendation to the officials. Finally, this kind of like temporary improvement can lead to permanent improvement. And the opportunities for sure, uh, now we are working with other cities in Indonesia and see this kind of like number of cities really keen to work for having the non-motorized transportation um, master plan. But then some of the things happen that they want to really see about the opportunities to get the funding. And actually the Ministry of Transportation also already targeted like 90% the buses will be electrified. So we want to go hand in hand with the plan of the Ministry of Transportation to tailor the needs of having and improve the public transportations along with the active mobility improvements. And the second one, the active mobility can be and should be tailored with the urban development planning because it will never be possible if we see maybe even Jakarta cases, Jakarta metropolitan area, people still not living within the city. So it's a bit difficult to expect people coming from Bogor, for example, to walk from Bogor to Jakarta, but then it really makes sense if we can tailor this kind of like housing, for example, or other land uses within the cities, within the walking and cycling environments. So distance, sorry. So this kind of like walking and cycling can be tailored together with the open development, open revitalization project, which is like make city make sense to work something bigger and achieve bigger kind of like funding or opportunities. And the third one also about linked to the transport demand management strategies, as mentioned before, it's like really impossible if we expecting people to shift to work and also cycling, if there is none of policies or regulations or action to work for to limit the traffic or the usage of the private motorized vehicle. So that's the thing that I can say now. And once again, as I mentioned in the first day, let's collaborate and connect to talk more. Always very impressed by your, your, your presentation and so much substance in just 10 minutes, so th thank you. Uh, it's also interesting to see that there is a uh, replication uh, going on, so nothing like developing good project, good practice, facing the realities, creating the condition, and then learning from it, and then repeating it in a different way, but building on, on, a, on a success. Thank you, uh, Deliani. Now, last presentation for this morning, uh, before we go to the Q&A and uh, the conversation we'd like to have with you uh, on all this. Uh, Ramola, you are going to talk to us about the role of active mobilities when developing livable cities. Thank you. Thank you, Bertrand, and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, so, thank you for inviting me, and it's... Uh, a pleasure to be here. So I'm probably one of the uh, ones who work on the other side, which is the urban planning side and not so much the transport planning. But uh, it's really good for us to really talk about integrated urban development and planning and transport planning together, land use and transport. And that doesn't happen very often. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a few uh, uh, challenges and, of course, the uh, uh, bit of a bigger picture overview of what we are doing here at ADB, uh, both for the uh, urban development and mobility. Um, we know these challenges, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, developing Asia is rapidly urbanizing. We have unplanned urbanization, creating, you know, much larger cities. They're expanding beyond boundaries. We have uh, clusters, uh, mega cities developing, and how do you manage all that? And that cannot be done without master planning, without uh, uh, planning your transport and land use. And uh, that is where we find that a lot of the cities are lagging behind. There's piecemeal work ongoing, or uh, there is really no uh, planning or no master plans. And for the last 10 years, ADB has been actively moving much upstream and trying to work with cities and governments to start urban planning. Uh, this was not an area that we were uh, working uh, uh, before, but this has been one of the key areas that we are addressing uh, going forward. 
cities are complex systems and uh, there's, there's a lot that you have to do housing, uh, work areas, how do you actually look at uh, live, work, and play together? Uh, what is the interconnectivity? How do you actually ensure that uh, people are able to move uh, effectively, efficiently, in a timely manner, and experience the city? So the idea is not just about um, uh, having things work efficiently, but for people to experience the city and enjoy it. And that's where we are coming with talking about livability. Uh, ADB has a uh, livable cities uh, focus, and we have a 5E approach. So what does the 5E approach really encompass? Uh, we look at economic competitiveness of a city, environmental sustainability and resilience, equity and inclusiveness. Some of my colleagues before me have spoken about what, what does it mean in the context of urban mobility. Uh, but what is also important is to have the right enablers and to engage, engage with people, with stakeholders. A lot of us have been talking uh, this morning about, uh, 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 you mentioned about talking to the right people to ensure that everybody is engaged in the development of a sustainable urban mobility plan. And I think that is where we are coming in uh, with upstream urban planning, trying to engage not only top down, but really bottom up, and working with various uh, groups such as um, the youth, uh, children, uh, businesses, uh, women uh, groups, maybe also uh, civil society uh, who's focused on green activism. There's, there's a whole range of uh, uh, stakeholders who are actively using the city, experiencing the challenges, and that's who we have to reach out. Uh, you also have to find champions. That is another way of uh, looking and moving things which may uh, be difficult. I uh, remembered uh, Bertrand's question earlier to David, uh, what would you do? And I would probably just take that person out walking in their own city and say, <laughs> how are you experiencing the city? And let's, let's you know, have a walk around. Uh, so that's the ADB 5E framework. But uh, what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit today is a few case studies on what we are doing with livable cities. Um, I started working in Georgia about 10 years back, and Bertrand is the one responsible for uh, getting me there. And uh, this uh, emerged as a very um, upstream engagement with the country where we started with national urban assessments, looking at what is the urban potential for this country? How do we actually look at planning? Um, not just planning uh, of cities, but strategic planning. And the government said that, oh, we think that um, our future is in tourism. Uh, tourism, uh, if you see Georgia, it's a country of about 3.5 million people. But the tourists that they receive every year is more than 7.5 million. So can you imagine having to cope with this kind of demand? So they wanted to plan their cities for this demand. And we went in and started working with... Um, uh, we identified areas, clusters, and we went down to the city level, to the regions, uh, to the municipalities, and looked at what might be their vision for the next 10 years. And the vision was not about the tourists who are coming in, but about livability. We asked the citizens, what do you want your city to look like in the next 10 years? Let's identify what are your short, medium, and long-term goals and actions. And we moved from there. In, in Tbilisi particularly, there was a lot that was going on. There was the Tbilisi, Tbilisi land use master plan. There was also later green city action plan. Uh, but uh, Bertrand really started the sustainable urban mobility plan discussions and bringing to the table the issues. Um, I'll just tell you a short story. I know I don't have much time, but this is very relevant. When I landed or in Tbilisi on a very cold evening in December, I decided to walk the talk, and I took a bus from the airport straight to the Freedom Square. And I thought, oh, wonderful. But I had this uh, suitcase, which I had to lug up three steps on the Matrushka, then reach Freedom Square, uh, got down, and I could just see my hotel right across. And I said, oh, great, I just have to cross. And then I realized there's no ad grid crossing. I had to go down again in a very... Uh, narrow and dark uh, uh, walkway under the uh, road, and I reached and I said, oh gosh, this is not a city 
designed for people. And that's where the dialogue started and the whole uh, discussion about how do we really bring in sustainable urban mobility. Um, we also worked around uh, several layers. Now, when I talk about the livable cities, it's not just about the transport, but it's about improvement of public spaces, improvement of health and safety standards. And uh, like I said, my experience uh, of not being able to walk across the street at grade and I imagine what it must be for people, persons with disabilities. What about the mother who's uh, taking a child in a buggy? And we thought that this is where we need to bring in accessibility standards. So we put together inclusive cities, urban area guidelines. Uh, this was one of the first of its kind across uh, the region. And it has now been adopted by the parliament and it is definitely something where uh, it's been implemented across uh, most of the public uh, projects. So it, it, it kind of was more of a holistic picture. How do we go and address the infrastructure needs and the institutional needs? Uh, so the Tbilisi uh, Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan is now called as the Tbilisi Transport Plan, and they have um, a good vision to deliver to the citizens of the Tbilisi, an effective, efficient, safe, and sustainable urban transport system that is accessible, affordable, and contributes to better quality of life. And they have a vision which they have uh, put together in the seven points that they mention. And going from, say, you know, what you see as um, maybe uh, uh, right up here, you will see what they have currently, or rather in 2016, going from that mode. Uh, to here where you have maybe almost 270 kilometers of uh, bicycle lanes and a higher share of public transport. Um, it is a commendable vision, but it's not always been easy because there's been a lot of back and forth, even with the citizens, even with other stakeholders about um, what is acceptable in terms of um, share of the street. But they have come up with some good um, action plans. While the Tbilisi transport plan is a 20-year uh, transport plan, what they have is a five-year action plan where they would invest uh, in very specific uh, active mobility options, uh, having a master bicycling network, um, working on super blocks, uh, uh, you know, the Barcelona model, and they're keen on piloting this. Uh, we are working on that under the Livable Cities project. Um, they are looking at introducing uh, the Freedom Square and Rustavelli Avenue. They are looking at introducing bike lanes and also making it a green plaza. Now, that is something which was really missing. Clearly, uh, has anyone visited Tbilisi? Let's see who's awake and ah, there. Okay, so you might have seen that it's really difficult with all the cars zooming across uh, Freedom Square to even enjoy that beautiful square. So that is something that they are uh, going to look at in the future, creating more public space, green spaces. Uh, even the waterfront was really just about uh, 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 car carriages, and instead of that, now they are looking at uh, bringing in more of a uh, pedestrianized network there, uh, which will link up with the old Tbilisi. Uh, it's a beautiful city. I do advise that you visit it and enjoy the lovely wine. Um, they also have uh, looked at uh, accessible metro. So when I mentioned earlier that uh, it was very difficult in terms of accessibility, uh, we are investing under the Livable Cities project uh, for making the metro, uh, at least 70% of the metro accessible. And those would be the investments which uh, uh, go forward in the next uh, three to five years. Um, there are other aspects of traffic management that they will also cover. Uh, this, this is, uh, sorry. This is uh, some of the work that they've been doing, just uh, glimpses of uh, how they've changed the uh, walking environment. Uh, this is at the Chachawatse Ch 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 Avenue. And um, yeah, it does now have uh, bike lanes and uh, good pedestrian pathways. Uh, underground trash collection and other things. Uh, there are other projects uh, uh, across uh, Asia and Pacific where ADB has uh, done some good work. Uh, these are mostly urban projects coming from the urban sector. 
uh, where uh, in PRC we have the Jilin Yanji Low Carbon Climate Resilient and Healthy City uh, project, which uh, also has uh, good investments in improving the neighborhoods uh, in areas. And I think you are all aware of the Zoo Peshawar. Uh, uh, can someone play the video from there? Ah, there it is. So uh, Khyber Pakhtunwala is, uh, uh, is another uh, uh, area in Pakistan, uh, the region in Pakistan, where uh, we have the Zoo Peshawar, the BRT system. And this, um, this really looked at one particular aspect, and that was on accessibility. So besides the BRT ensuring that a lot more women could um, uh, move within the city because there was a lot of restriction on uh, women moving in the city. This, uh, this project actually enabled women to go without an escort, without a family member accompanying them. And it's a very uh, gender-friendly um, uh, system. So this was also uh, one of those uh, very well-designed projects. It took quite a lot of public consultation uh, discussions uh, not only with the existing bus uh, networks but also a lot of institutional change but this has brought about a huge change and uh, to the lives of people there um, and finally we have um, we also have other small pockets of work that goes on uh, under the urban projects in uh, Pakistan, we have the city center of Abbottabad, which is being pedestrianized. This is a very old market, and uh, this will also undergo uh, changes so that you know there's more pedestrian-friendly infrastructure, and uh, people have a better environment, including the cover and awnings and uh, other aspects which were mentioned earlier. So I think uh, just to close on that, uh, we are looking at not only uh, how do we plan urban mobility, enable walking, cycling, but what is the big picture in terms of livability and improving the quality of life of citizens across? Thank you. Thank you, Ramola. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, Tbilisi is a MYC member uh, city. Um, we are pleased to have a delegation from Georgia also joining the, the, the transport forum. And what is extremely impressive is the journey. Uh, seeing the city as it is today compared to what it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And um, it's continuously improving, uh, learning from one project to, 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 to the next. And the, um, uh, even the approach, the, the planning approach um, uh, has evolved and um, with the support of the Mobilize Your City partnership and from the ADB as part of the urban transport program that we have. Now TBDC has finalized a sustainable urban mobility plan following the MYC methodology. Um, and in terms of uh, resource, other than the ADB loan, the Mobilize Your City partnership has been able um, to a grant by the French Development Agency. Uh, to uh, provide a technical advisor uh, just located in the transport department in, in a city working with colleagues day to day addressing issues uh, raising awareness but working uh, with the team trying just to do uh, and develop the, the, the best project so that's a good example we have this focus on Tbilisi but we could talk about other cities um, as well um, to Quick questions before um, uh, we, we start the, the Q&A. Maybe to you, Deliani, I think we've all been very impressed uh, with, your, with your presentation. Um, what was the game changer? Um, so what were the main arguments that were used to convince the decision maker not to develop just a BRT, but to add this um, accessibility and MT component uh, around it, taking the occasion of the BRT. What was the key uh, arguments to, to convince them? So, yeah, giving back a story when we met the governor, we convinced him that people need it. Just because we can see based on, so we showed the data about the number of the passengers. We showed the data number of complaints coming from the citizens. We also showed him a data that mentions about the needs 
and the conditions why they do not want to take a walk or even more to bike around the neighborhood, even want to go to the nearest uh, groceries, for example, they need a motorbikes to go only one kilometers. By showing him these complaints, we tell him that if you want to change the face of the city, you need this improvement. Because people will also need this improvement. Though they do not understand, I mean like, though the citizen doesn't explicitly mention that they need the pedestrians and cycling facilities to be improved. But by analyze the complaints, we can refer back or recommend that this kind of like improvements are needed. So that kind of like the things that we, we told him. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ramala, the question to you is maybe in the absence of a transit system, so in the absence of a metro BRT, if we just would like to develop active mobility in our, in our, our city, so how should we approach it and what are the main arguments when we don't have the excuse of this new BRT project or metro project that we want to, to make? So you left the tough question to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I know you like them. So, um, yeah, he never warns you what you uh, can expect. Um, I think it's very important that you plan around what are people's expectations. And um, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that the different modes of transport, actually, if, if you give people a, you know, a complete uh, clean slate, they might actually choose to live in a more dense uh, environment where you can live, work, and play. And it's not necessary that you need to travel for work. So I think uh, mixed-use developments, the typologies of uh, urban planning forms that are changing, that would really bring about a change in the need to travel. So I think it's, it's also about not just, um, it's about choices that people can have and the options uh, for mobility. Given a choice, they may not want to go in for a car and a long two-hour ride to their workplace, um, or even having to use an overcrowded public transit system. They might want to have a more option of just you know, 10 minutes down the road, I just go, I grab my coffee, and I go to work. And those kind of neighborhoods need to be planned, kind of the green city models where you can build incrementally, but also you can green a neighborhood one at a time. So it's not necessary you have to address the issues of the entire city at the same time, but it can be done in an incremental manner. And uh, the slow change, and particularly if you look at a lot of the older cities, um, there's a need for urban regeneration. There are a lot of empty uh, places, um, old heritage sites which are not redeveloped, they're just lying um, uh, barricaded. And this, again, I'm talking about the Tbilisi, there's a huge potential to revamp that and go through a regeneration phase and uh, redesign spaces, um, uh, whatever lofts you might have, or uh, just infilling the city, I think is very important from a planning perspective. Thank you. That is great. Thank you. Thank you, Ramala. Um, I will invite two more guests uh, to join you on the stage. Um, we, um, so we have a faila. Uh, she is Faila Sufa. She is a uh, transport specialist with the ADB. Welcome, Faila. And she has been involved in many different projects like this. So we'd like to hear your views. And Clément Musil, maybe most of you know him. Uh, those who have been uh, involved in MYC activity know Clément is a program manager for the Mobilize Your City. Uh, Asia program uh, for so for those who have ongoing activity with MYC uh, from the application stage to the implementation of pro programs, uh, Clement is the is the focal person for that uh, and, and working with our beneficiaries. Um, and we're also starting the um, conversation and Q and A. So if you have questions, uh, there is a microphone in the middle of the room. Uh, so um, and we'll have to have the, this conversation as well. I will also uh, acknowledge the presence of some of our member uh, cities. 
uh, we have a representative from uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, who has uh, become a MYC city uh, last year. We organized a MYC workshop in October last year, very, very productive. I can also see representative from Davao in the, in the Philippines, uh, currently in the process of becoming uh, MYC member. So um, really we would like also to hear from, from the members in this discussion. Um, quick question to the two of you um, uh, to, to start this. It's a very simple one. Maybe to, to you, Faila, first. Um, can non-motorized transport really transform and change our cities? Um, thank you, Bretan. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think uh, that question already answered by the slide from the, all of the speakers. But um, yeah, um, let me um, share it a bit. So um, based on the slide that uh, the, all of the speakers shared with us, um, the key of um, how uh, our city, like uh, Ramola mentioned, uh, become livable with non-motorized transport, that's uh, supposed to be planned holistically. Um, it's not only building um, a pedestrian walkway or a, 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 um, a bicycle lanes, but um, it has uh, to be supported by a strong uh, policies. So in addition to the infrastructure, because uh, when we walk, um, so we want to uh, have uh, our distance reachable uh, by walking and cycling. Uh, how to do that? So we need to have policy, for example, like mixed use uh, policies. So then we can go to the office easily by walking or cycling and then um, direct access. Um, so not detour, uh, like Ramola experience. Uh, she has to go down uh, to the tunnel, but not direct access. Um, and then compact as well. Uh, maybe like um, um, we have to ha uh, have a policy on how we build like the existing, from the existing um, built up city. And then um, in terms of walking and also cycling, mainly walking, we need to have um, a walking more uh, uh, pleasant. Uh, so the experience on how we walk. So that include like um, greeneries or shading maybe because um, like in uh, Manila, so it's really hot now. So I live nearby here, but um, I, I'm going to wait like if uh, uh, able, going to wait to SM Mega Mall open first, <laughs> then uh, coming through from my apartment to here because it's <coughs> really hot, so shade is also very important. And then up active frontage. We, we don't want to walk like, um, like, yeah, the walls. We, want, we don't want to see the walls. So if we can walk around like um, shopping, like area, like window shopping, something like that, but across the street, that's also generate economy. And then um, maybe like the important thing is um, um, curbside management, like how we also manage parking. Because like when we walk sometimes like encroachment on our sidewalk, that will be like a disaster for us as well. We have nice uh, pedestrian, but it's like cars or motorcycles sit there. That's not good. And um, yeah, that's a holistic. Uh, and then the, the other way is uh, uh, this uh, walking or a pedestrianization area can be a public space as well, can be a third place for us. Our kid can also uh, play around, around that area. Uh, so then city become more livable. And with those holistic approach, like I, I also heard about um, limited budget, and then policies, um, and then uh, the timeline of the project, the priority. So fortunately, as a, a bank, ADB, like Ramola already uh, mentioned about the list of uh, projects that uh, see work, yeah. We have uh, several um, uh, financial assistance. Uh, for example, like the infrastructure, there is a project loan, of course, and then for the policies, for the wider approach, uh, we have a policy-based loan that uh, we can also assist the city to develop policy to support all of it. And a combination of two, there is a sector development plan as well. We can also support on the uh, uh, public sector um, uh, um, 
engagement on this as well with the uh, uh, PPP. So yeah. Very appealing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fela. And uh, Clement, just in case there is somebody left in the room that is not convinced that uh, active mobility can change our city, so what would you tell that person? Okay, I will try to not repeat anything, but uh, probably like something we can have in mind. Uh, two two things. It's not concept. It's not. But like, let's start with two words: uh, data and scale. So data in order to uh, convince everyone. So for example, with Mobilize Your City, we, we are developing, uh, developing SUMP, and through the SUMP, we are do doing like quantitative, qualitative surveys and all that. And walking and uh, cycling were so far invisible. And with the data, we made uh, all that visible uh, because uh, usually we're, we are focused on uh, motorized uh, transport traffic and all that. So, First of all, it's like to have the data, as also Deviani said, uh, to convince uh, people uh, in, in Jakarta uh, for that. Uh, so data is important. Uh, after that, the scale. Scale, uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's great, uh, David, what you show you know, about Dubai, like the crazy dimension, uh, vertically uh, spread and all that. Uh, but at the end, we are all uh, human beings, and you know we need to have to come back to the human scale. And uh, walking and cycling is really that to work on human scale. It's great. We have the technology. Uh, the technology also it costs money. Uh, some donors are there also to support, and we need this technology with the MRT, BRT, and all that. But at the end, when we are out of the MRT, when we are out of the BRT, yeah, it's human scale, just as you said, to cross the, the, the road, as you said, Ramola, to reach your hotel uh, with your suitcase, but and, or with, to, to work with the kids and, and all that. So it, it's that to have in mind, uh, data, data in scale, in order to start uh, a, good, uh, a good project and to convince people. <laughs> Thank you, Clément. And I like the way we have all these different uh, arguments we can find and way of, of putting things. Um, one thing that we have seen evolving is n in the past year is that non-motorized transport and active modes really have become, has become um, a transport mode per se. Um, and even ADB as an organization, we are really ready uh, to support projects that are NMT. You don't need to have a BRT, a metro, or the initiative to develop NMT. You can have an impact at scale with NMT um, on a city. Uh, so we have many big cities in Asia, so a lot of transport and transit system have been uh, constructed in the past two, two decades and uh, Asia has been leading this when we look at the number again. And uh, sometimes taking a city where the, the new metro line is not necessarily very well integrated in the urban environment, so you spend um, billion of, of dollars on new infrastructure. So maybe it could be worthwhile to invest this extra 100 or 200 million dollars um, just to, to, to work on the accessibility to, um, to, to this station. Uh, one way of convincing the decision maker is also in the number. Because if you improve the accessibility to this system, of course you're creating a better environment and all these nice things that we've been talking about. But you're increasing the revenues because you're increasing the ridership. Uh, and it's automatic, and it doesn't take a uh, large uh, capex investment because your infrastructure is already there, your metro is already there. It's just that you increase the use of it, and with this increased usage, you increase the revenue. So uh, that that's for the benefit also uh, of the finance uh, uh, of the city. So many many different benefits. Um, so we've been having this very interesting discussion and seeing all the, the dimension of what NMT can bring and the importance of active modes in our cities in Asia. Um, now I would like to hear from you, uh, maybe even on the challenges you're, you're facing, uh, on the good example that you've seen in the city as a user, um, as um, 
decision maker, maybe. So please, any, any question you have to, to the panel or aspect of discussion you would like to, to start, don't be shy. We are among friends. Uh, we've been together for a few days now, so we, we know each other. Uh, so you can take the mic. I've not seen question uh, on the app yet, but uh, anybody would like to uh, share experience, uh, good practice that I see, or question to any of our speakers. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself before uh, asking your, your question. Hello. Uh, good morning. My name is George Buid. I'm a photojournalist, so I'm also a part of the cycling community. So um, I, I seen your presentation is very nice. I just wonder how will you apply this in the, in the Philippines? Because um, the problem here is now, the big issue now is that they're removing the bike lane in EDSA and the different uh, government agencies have different minds. So the DPWH don't care and MMDA don't care. So <laughs> how do you think you can convince the, the politicians here for uh, uh, more walking and cycling uh, city? Thank you. Thank you. I, I like this question because it's very practical. Uh, we've been talking about all the nice things and you want to, to be able to, to, to enjoy them. Um, Part of the answer, I believe, and I will ask the, our expert to, to share views on this, is in your question. Fragmented institutions. So who can lead this? Or um, is there any body that can uh, go across the different agencies that are uh, involved in this to make it materialize? So who, that, that's what's behind your, your question as well. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at my friends um, who would like to, Ramallah? Thank you. I think uh, that's a tough one. I've been living in Manila for 19 years, <laughs> and we still haven't figured out an answer. But um, I think one uh, area that uh, really requires uh, addressing this is when citizens demand, then you get the responses. And I think that's where it has been lacking. There hasn't been enough of a movement uh, to demand your share of the space. And um, uh, it isn't that there is no willingness amongst the politicians, but it is a issue of fragmented institutions. Uh, MMDA cuts across, uh, what, 17 cities now? Uh, so it's not, uh, it, it, it's, it's much more about who can be a champion. And uh, I think the more uh, uh, civil society raises its voice and says that this is what we want, because we've had car-free days. If uh, I mean, ADB has been involved in trying to get this area having a car-free uh, Sunday. There's been a lot of uh, efforts even on cycling paths and others, but um, it hasn't become a movement because there's, you know, of course it's not easy cycling in a city like Manila. It's, it's hot, humid, and hot, so, <laughs> so we do need to have a much wider um, investment also in kind of, you know, uh, greening the city, lowering the temperature, and we've had a record uh, uh, high of 39 plus degrees this year, so uh, I, I think that it needs much more uh, urban planning uh, a actions also, and um, yeah, we are also trying to work as much as we can uh, to try and push this agenda. Um. Okay. No, uh, the, the thing with it, with it, it's an interesting one because, again, and, and as, as we were saying before, uh, data, data-driven decisions are important. Uh, we all know ETSA, and we think that, you know, you take ETSA from the beginning and you ride the whole ETSA all the way up or south. Uh, if we want to make a bicycle line in ETSA, what I would do first is analyze if we need it that way along ETSA cycling or if we really need other ways of facilitating or other trip patterns that are really suitable for bicycle. Right now, uh, we are working on MRT4 project and what we discover is that it is rather more convenient and we can really target way more people if we like they did in Jakarta, if we enhance accessibility to the stations up to one, two, three kilometers around the stations by bicycle, rather than 
providing for a 20 kilometer long corridor on bicycle, which no one in Manila and hardly in any city is going to make. So that's, that's for me, that will be the, the first idea to analyze as, as a technician and as a da data-driven person, I would say, okay, do we really have mobility trips which are that long and that are really necessarily this to be done on bicycle? Probably, no, I don't know. Uh, and probably there are other uh, interventions which will have a higher, way higher impact on the modal split and the, and the enhancement of accessibility. This is what I think about it, uh, having been here and having planned uh, MRT4 uh, system. Thank you, David. Uh, I've seen there was an end up, yes, please, sir. Introduce yourself kindly and uh, ask your question. Hello, good morning. My name is Dennis Somailo. Uh, I'm, my field is in communications and um, what I like about NMT really is that it humanizes transportation rather than purely industrializes transportation. But my question is, how was your experience designing and implementing wayfinding systems in the projects that you've already mentioned? And how do you think can it also be implemented in the Philippine context? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe that's a question for you, Deliane. Well, yeah, actually, it's kind of like really interesting when we work, so in Jakarta um, and also other cities, we work with the communities. We finally do also engage with the journalists as well, maybe from the first questions as well. Journalists play a very important role. We do media training. So um, this kind of like situation set a condition where we can do a trial and also like urban guerrilla in context of wayfinding. We set a context and also play a game. We set the cast and the people will do, like let's say after you go out from this station, you should look uh, a way to go to a certain places. And then people start to note about what kind of like challenges, how, how, how will they get lost in certain places, in which points, and what kind of like information that they are needed. So that kind of like, play game kind of like things happened in Jakarta. We do that kind of like things by doing with the voluntary works and also we invite people to the test. So we do some of like prototyping as well. So prototyping projects where we install the temporary wayfinding and then people start to comment and post their kind of like comments and how to they want to recommend how we want to finalize or make it perfect and make it more visible or helpful for them. So that kind of like things happen to us. But back then to the finding the champions, we also usually create this kind of like very unique narrative and looking for the momentum. For example, if I know that the city mayor will be changed, so I will prepare, my team will prepare the number of strategies as well as how to, um, to make it as a simple as way to communicate with public. So the political, uh, the politic people, they will can get, uh, get this kind of like message in a very clear way, how I can get more popular popularization coming from the citizens. So that kind of like things happen. So we make it like very simple pathway in technical and also how we engage with the community, uh, the communities and how we can give these impacts back and also engage with the communities because of somehow the political people, they really, really want to be seen by the citizens because they want to be elected for the next term. So that kind of like things we, we also put within our strategies. Yeah, there really are the few strategies uh, we, we can use. Uh, maybe I was so cautious of the time because the, the, the discussion will continue. So as I said, we are, we've been in the room for two, two hours, so maybe there will be time for coffee. Uh, all of our uh, speakers will stay in the room till uh, noon, so we can have also this uh, discussion continued in a, at the table or uh, around a nice cup of coffee. But I've seen there are more questions, so maybe we'll take one last question before the break. So we'll take two, because I see two ends. <laughs> so, please. Good morning. Um, I'm Jason Corpus from the Department of Transportation. Um, in Southeast Asian countries, um, paratransit vehicles are a very popular form of uh, public transport. In fact, it has become uh, part of their culture. 
Now, um, how can we integrate, link paratransit vehicles in such a way that um, they're linked to major land transport vehicles that could potentially promote uh, seamless multimodal connectivity? Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, the Mobilize Your City partnership uh, has been working in para transit in region across the world. Um, it's a very challenging issue, issue but there are some solutions. Uh, maybe I will invite you, Nicolas, to share a little bit. Um, yes, so at Mobilize Your City, I mentioned it during my presentation before, we developed this toolkit for paratransit uh, services. Uh, trying to uh, challenge this idea that this is an undesirable way of transport because at the end it's a service that is being providing access to a lot of people, even if it's not officially regulated by state or if it has its problems. So the idea and what we're trying to push at Mobilize Your City is to uh, have these reform processes and reform policies in a way that we can bring everyone together and make them participate from this uh, transformation, professionalization of the services. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's very common, especially for big projects, uh, for example, BRT uh, lines or MRT lines that uh, in a city, especially in Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, that we're going to have also parallel uh, professionalization uh, projects for paratransit services. Uh, and we've seen that's been also like a good solution for last mile connectivity uh, as we've been presenting and uh, this is not fully related to active modes of transport of course because the type of vehicles can be very diverse uh, but also paratransit uh, services can come in three wheelers not necessarily electrified uh, and this is also a good solution for for to increase the accessibility as you were as you were mentioning in your on your presentation. Uh, so if you want to know more, please come to me. We can have a talk, and then I will direct you to the resources that Mobilize Your City we made available to take care of this uh, of this issue. Yeah, this, May I this, add? this is a vast topic. Yes, please. Farida. Yeah, maybe in the case of uh, Davao. Um, uh, specifically, yeah. uh, we have a lot of tricycles as well, like um, supporting the mobility of people of Davao um, uh, in Manila as well. So we have to recognize them uh, first. That's uh, the first thing. Um, and then for the uh, um, improvement, yeah, it can be stages. We can, uh, in Davao, we will have a new uh, modernized bus system, and but uh, we shouldn't forget about um, yeah, the, the seamless journey. They will also uh, need to um, reach their journey with these uh, three cycles. Um, by recognizing them, we also need to ensure that um, the level of service will also be the same uh, because uh, we don't want to have like a nicer air conditioner bus and then ended up with uh, unsafe, uh, really polluted uh, three cycles. So yeah. Uh, there's a case as well in Jakarta. So they start with the uh, um, um, uh, reformize, uh, um, reformation of uh, the main lane lines first, like the main corridor with the BRT. Um, and then gradually they also work with the um, Angkot, which is a um, 14 seater smaller buses at the end to ensure that uh, um, seamless mobility from um, the uh, um, origin to destinations, um, in addition to, of course, active mobility, which is uh, working and also cycling. But uh, not all of the destination can be reached by um, uh, walking, but maybe we need to have uh, smaller modes. So that is why ensuring that the level of service is also the similar, uh, we, we also need to work on that. There's a lot of um, homework, but uh, yeah, we can start from the important thing, why we start on the uh, main corridor first, because there's a huge impact that uh, all of the people will uh, use that main corridor, but gradually we can also work um, on that um, mode as well. Thank you. Thank you, Faila. 
Uh, let's take one last question, and um, we uh, have that lady at the back of the room. You've been raising your hand for quite some time, so that would be the last question. But again, that's not the end of the session. Then we will go have coffee so you can uh, approach us, and we can come back to the room after and have a discussion around the table. Please. Thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Gillian, and I'm from the Asian Institute of Tourism, University of the Philippines, and also... Uh, advisor of the city of government, the city government of the Avao, no? So my question is actually about um, something to do with capacity building. You've been highlighting about collaborations and I'd like to hear from the speaker, how was your experience working with the academe? Right now the challenge, especially in developing countries, that there are very limited number of, um, how to say, specialized person working on transport planning. No? Like for instance, in our in our city, <laughs> we've been looking for how many like you know, inborn from the city who studied transport planning because we know that transport planning is also a science, right? Um, it's an art and a science. So I'm also wondering how you're working because transport planning or urban planning in general should involve different disciplines. So for instance, we're trying to promote wa uh, walkable cities and we've highlighted the importance of having shaded trees. But then we also need to understand native trees for you to understand native trees, you need to work with botanists, right? Or with biologists. So I'm just wondering, how do you see that integrated and how do you institutionalize the capacity, you know, because we want sustainability and for that to be sustainable, we really have to work. So for instance, in my case, I really look, I, I'm, I'm also quite new in the academy for a long time, I, I'm a practitioner. And one of my, my realization is that every time um, I, I look for a university, we're in planning, transport, pla uh, transportation is being studied. So it was only one, and uh, it so happened to be the Asian Institute of Tourism for the undergrads, you know, college students. And I recognize that uh, just giving like an, or a brief overview of what transportation and its relations to urban planning, especially tourism, can actually have an impact. Like, for instance, when I ask them, how do you encourage tourists to, to use public, uh, to use transport, what kind of transportation would you use? Uh, would you tell your tourist friends no, to use in the Philippines? And all of them would say, oh, we will hire cars, we will have private grab and all taxis, but never public transport. But at the end of my course, most of my students will tell me they change completely. Now they will have, have appreciation of walkability because we have walking tours. So I'm just wondering, how are you doing that in other countries? And there are, do we have any good lessons also? Because we're also learning. That's the thing with the academy. We're also always, always learning. So I'm just wondering, how do you do that? So that, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time. That, we've been that, part of that, that, is a, that is a perfect question. Yes. Thank you for so asking you. it. And um, we talk about awareness, but um, knowledge and capacity development is important. And uh, the reason why I like the question is, is that it is part of the pillars of the, of the partnership. Uh, Clément, I'm looking at you, maybe you would like to explain, in the context of MYC, uh, maybe tell us uh, about how MYC can support this capacity development and multidisciplinary uh, approach. Yeah. Um, I will stay with the MYC because we can, uh, <laughs> from the ac academic background and all that, we can we can speak a lot about all, all that. Um, what is good in the in the approach of the of the mobilize your city? It is, as Nicolas said, one of uh, the major instruments that uh, we are promoting is the SUMP, and through the SUMP, uh, I don't dig and develop the methodology, but there is like a full cycle, and into these full cycles. Uh, basically, we develop uh, a lot of different trainings with thematic approach and uh, also to uh, make an echo uh, with, uh, with your question, with, uh, you know, to target also different level uh, um, as a knowledge from the beginners to the expert and uh, uh, people who are working in, into the field. So uh, this is uh, now, like uh, as uh, Bertrand mentioned, uh, 
Uh, this partnership uh, exists now uh, since 2015-2016. Uh, uh, we had time to develop the, this and those methodology. It's huge. I know also in the room, like some colleagues are also from other projects, are also using uh, this, uh, this material. Uh, so the material was developed, developed in collaboration with different stakeholders and all that to make the material very accessible understandable uh, and after that so the it was the creation of the, the material and uh, now with the our colleagues from uh, from Brussels and uh, and the secretariat there is also uh, several different uh, webinars training in person online um, with different cycle uh, as well so uh, I would say the material is available uh, the material is also, we have like some stuff uh, available on, on YouTube uh, as well. Uh, but the material is available, but also the people uh, are available uh, for this. And, um, and this capacity de development support provided by MYC can really take uh, many different forms. So there, there are all these materials that are readily available. There are webinars that are organized that can be accessed online. So all this, all the guidelines, all the nice things, so is there. And by becoming a member, even for the non-member actually, because uh, most of it I I is open source uh, uh, on the web. So you can, you can access all this. Then by becoming an MYC member city, you can maybe uh, access the next level. Um, support for capacity development that would be tailored to the needs of your project of, or of your city. Um, we have um, Ezawal in, uh, in India, who recently, um, which recently became a, a member. Uh, they are looking to know more about how cable option can be used as um, urban mobility solutions. And um, with the support of uh, MYC, so there are some knowledge activities that have been uh, developed. Um, so it can take many forms, expert coming uh, to you, working with um, the, the various services. Uh, can be also discussion with other cities. Um, you want to do cable, so let's look at Latin America. They've been uh, doing a lot of nice projects there. And remember, MYC is a global partnership. So maybe you want to talk to the mayor of La Paz that, uh, and he will explain you um, how successful the project uh, there was and uh, how nicely the, the system worked. But maybe more importantly, all the challenges um, that um, he has faced and uh, uh, how to try to, to overcome them. So the, that, that's why becoming a MYC member, uh, so you, you become part of this group committed to sustainable urban mobility and making better cities, but you will be able to go beyond and have some um, very much tailored uh, assistance. So if there is a need on capacity development on particular topics, um, even at the university, I'm sure there is a, a big university in Davao, if you, uh, they want to have support developing new curriculum and things like this. So uh, all this synergy can, uh, can, be, can be created. Um, and Mobilize Your City will not do everything for you, but will facilitate things. Um, you will easily be able to, to talk to peers from other universities, uh, other organizations. So, yeah, but I, I like this question because we are often looking at the infrastructure part and all the project part, all the pilot, all the ni nice things that are um, extremely important. But uh, investing on people and um, not reinventing the wheel, but looking at the nice things that have been done in other places is, is, is very, very important. Um, a short one and then we'll go for coffee because I've yes. been promising this for quite some time. I like the discussion, but I know that a shot of caffeine sometimes <laughs> helps the discussion as well. Yeah, so just a very quick and short one about how we uh, worked uh, in uh, Georgia. Uh, we actually worked with the ISEC, uh, which is a youth organization in Georgia, and uh, there is no urban planning course uh, at uh, Oh, they don't want me to talk. Yeah, I think I 
So uh, we had uh, what is called job shadowing. We got the youth to work and the university students to work with our consultants and they job shadowed this and uh, they did some asset mapping, GIS asset mapping for tourism assets and they also learned uh, the skills on the job. So that kind of creates an interest also in the field uh, which can then be triggered and uh, the next step is uh, for us to try and uh, link up uh, Leiden University and others uh, with uh, universities in Tbilisi to develop courses uh, which are for urban and transport planning. Thank you. Thank you, Ramola. So, before we go to coffee, I think you understand that um, MYC is somehow your service and can bring many things, but more importantly, we'll try to identify the needs and really respond to, 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 to your demand. Uh, and if you're already uh, an MOEC member, so you know the kind of thing that um, uh, Mobilize Your City can bring. If you're not a member yet, and if you're interested in all this, so uh, please approach us, uh, approach Clement. Um, also, of course, all this is in a consultation with the ADB project team you are dealing with, or you are about to, to, to deal with when it comes to, to your urban mobility project. Um, we, I, I said that we have started a second phase of the Mobilize Your City Asia program that come with some fresh technical assistance uh, grant that is available. Um, so mostly to complement the project that you're already developing. So you have this nice initiative, you want to go a step further, you want to have uh, more possibilities to develop capacities, you already have a nice project, but maybe the NMT component has been neglected for, for good reason, because uh, those projects are complex. Then you can approach Mobilize Your City and uh, maybe get this extra support. It can take many forms. You've heard that it can even be a technical advisor that will be working with you for, for two years as you are developing your, your, your project, so you will have direct ac access to, to, to this knowledge. It can be support to update your planning document or maybe turn them into a sustainable urban mobility plan and add the missing component. Um, so many things. Um, I will not say on the menu because I, I, I don't like to use this word, but um, everything that we will um, collectively find relevant to improve uh, the project, improve the uh, mobility condition in your city, uh, that's really the, the spirit um, uh, of MYC and how we would like to, to work with you.